we're going to finish our discussion on starting your breathing program. So why don't we just jump right in there and get started? And if you're showing your birds, you should not lose points for having a wing band. And you won't. You won't. Well, that's that's the common. That's the only real detractor I hear from people is like, I want to show my birds. But so what? Fine. If they're going to, they'll show a bird with a leg band on it, not think twice. Well, they think that that may cause the wing to droop a little. Nah, it doesn't. If it's if properly it's, on there, it's not going to bother them at all. And putting it in is doesn't cause a bird, even an adult bird, doesn't cause them any distress. Right. Well, you've been an APA judge for quite a while, and you've never. Yeah. It's not part of the band. chicken. Not part of the chicken. I'm just the chicken, not the application of the wing band or the leg band. Question. When y'all put wing bands on, do you put it in the bird's left wing or the bird's right wing? I was planning to use that as an organizational method. I've been using the right wing for everything to this point and reserving the left wing for future use. For what? Another secondary tag? Yes. For what? Explain. Identify, identify other traits. Or, or other other things you want to attract. I always put mine in the bird's left wing. And you never yeah. had cause to use the right? Or did you no. hold that in the wings for future no. use? Never use the right. Well, I hold and, the bird in my left hand. And yeah. I fan out the what would be the bird's right wing and find my tag and read it. So to me, it needs to be on that right wing. Try it on the left wing. It's a lot easier. Then the bird's facing forward. Yeah, I always hold a bird in my hand. I want the tip of the keel bone, front tip of the keel bone, touching up against the heel of my hand. Mm -hmm. I'm supporting the bird. I've got the two fingers in the middle, or the three fingers in the middle, underneath the bird's body. I hold the bird's wings, left wing with my right thumb, right wing, excuse me, their right wing in my right thumb, and their left wing, Clamp down against them. Mine are too big bit. to do that. I can no, have. No, they're not. No, they're oh, not. Oh, we'll find out in November. You got the little teeny big. tiny hands. In. And, the, <laughs> and the reason I use that left wing is because my tendency is when I'm holding them facing me, I just fan out the. I learned this in judging. First thing I do is I hold a bird. I'm feeling the length of the keel bone as I hold it in my hand. I know how far does the keel bone go from the heel of my hand towards the tips of the finger. And you have your fingertips towards the back side of that keel? Yeah. The whole keel bone's running through my palm and right down to my middle finger. I've been doing it from the other direction, and maybe that's what makes it goofy sometimes. It, it can make it different. But I'm also, that's I'm using my right hand to examine the bird. I fold out the wing to check the primaries and secondaries. That's the first thing I do. All right? So I automatically begin putting the wing band in their left wing, because that's the wing I go to first, actually. I wonder if that's the difference between showing and growing for meat. I mean, the way that I've always seen and the way that I naturally started handling birds, nobody ever taught me how to pick up and hold a bird. Yeah, that's where I'm at. No one taught me. I'm just winging it. But I figured out that if I put it in the palm of my hand with the legs dangling through my fingers and I can Mm -hmm. tuck the head kind of underneath this arm Mm -hmm. to shield its eyes, it pretty much just goes to sleep in my arm. Yeah. And I can do whatever I want. Yeah, exactly right. The I'll have reason, the bird against the front of me so I can check the wing on that side. And nah. then I'll... All right, I'm do overcomplicating they, it then. Do they flap around a lot? Some of when them you do. do. I'm not supporting them properly. Exactly. Birds have a fear of falling. And when they start flopping around, it's because they're not comfortable. They're afraid they're going to fall. Support them in your hand. Some holding one wing. Pinky finger holding another wing against the body. And if you have to, stick your head under your arm. They will not struggle. So when your finger, your pinky and your thumb, and they're holding the wing, Mm -hmm. what part of the wing are you making contact with? Is it like the tip tip feathers? Yeah, tip of the primary. And that's enough? Yeah. If if they, I will say, 99 times out of 100, it's enough. If they still struggle, head goes under my arm. They get dark, they they relax. Yeah. We skipped over the part of talking about the scale of points in the SOP to help guide. And she's right. We do need to touch on that. 
I use the scale of points in the standard of per perfection to help me guide my breeding decisions. Every bird is going to have their faults and every flock usually will have the same general classification of faults, but common fault. Com it's so, and it keeps you from getting fixated on an insignificant trait. This is How many why times it's important? Yeah, you know exactly. How many times have we seen people obsessing over the number of points on a single cone bird? All the time, in my opinion. All the time. Yeah. Well, it's it's in any breed. It's in any breed. Would you necessarily call a side sprig? Oh, absolutely. That's a Every disqualification. Time. Would you call six points instead of five? No. No. If everything goes as good, six points doesn't mean anything. Because if you go to the scale of points, you know, when when you're evaluating and selecting birds, every bird starts off at 100 points and defects count as individual number of points. The higher the point value, that's the more that tells you where you need to start putting your emphasis. An extra point on a cone is only a half point cut. Versus too short of a back would because that's the back a, itself is 10 points. Exactly. Right. When the comb is a total of five, if I remember right, I don't have it in front of me. Standard bred heritage bird will have all the production qualities because it's yeah. going to have the body capacity and the in theory, yeah, and fleshing. And I'll be, I'll you're, tell you, you're breeding, you're breeding a dual purpose bird or a, whatever your standard is. That's what you should be breeding, not just a pretty bird. There's a whole section in the standard of perfection that admonishes exhibitors and judges to pay attention to the production of ability of a bird. Does it happen often? Very infrequently do people who are showing birds pay attention to that. And that's what really damaged a lot of our dual purpose birds and standard bred birds. Yeah. But it's also and I was late to the party. Genetics. So we do have the preservation of genetics to thank for them. To get yes, some, absolutely. Even, even the genetics are still alive today is because of the show people. Exactly. Mandy, you started to say something and we walked all over you there. Yeah, and I forgot what it was. <laughs> oh, see, taking my bad I, oh, it was, I feel like I was late to the party on doing this whole utility thing in the midst of how exhibition has gone over the past 50 years or so, where a lot of those dual purpose attributes were lost in favor of aesthetics and when i'm at a show and i'm walking the aisles i really will walk every single aisle of every single breed in the entire building and well when when you go to the oi national this year you better have <laughs> two pairs of good walking shoes with you because you're gonna wear a couple one of changes of <laughs> now just wear my favorites it'll be all right There's probably no i walked it twice last time i was up at ohio yeah but and then when i would go out here. on smoke breaks i'd find some other people and we cluster up and talk about chickens until we were mm -hmm. well educated <laughs> that's the fun part about going to shows folks is the friendships and the fellowship that's the best part that means more to me than winning prizes i uh, just being but, around other poultry people that understand our whatever we want to call it our passion so yeah. once you get a gaggle of bird people together man <laughs> is it a gaggle or a flock and is well, it a flock? It's whatever bird flock? term you want to use. Well, I use a non bird term. It's a train load of folks. Well, that's vintage. I, well, <laughs> what would you expect from me? I'm vintage myself. <laughs> Getting back to reading to the standard, if we don't breed to a written standard, it's we're going to wind up breeding birds that don't look like, that don't perform like, breed what the as the breed was developed to do well you can get dangerously close to having birds that are more similar to well, what's the term barnyard mixes and stuff yeah. where you yeah. can't accurately figure out what they are like one hybrid that comes to mind is easter eggers and mm -hmm. how they interchangeably use americana as a breed name and that's doing the purebred birds a disservice because they're dramatically different because that's, an actual SOP bred Americana has set color parameters yeah. and set standards. And there's 
goals to achieve in their breeding versus an Easter egg or that can be any color and lay any color egg. And well, Mandy, that can happen in a lot of other breeds too. Rhode Island reds, for example, hatchery Rhode Island reds and standard bred reds do not look like the same breed. I heard that the hatchery Rhode Islands are more of a production red yeah. type of bird. Exa- exactly. Well, they're satisfying um, a requirement from a different customer. Exactly. They're and that's, looking at that's breeding like the standard Mandy. If if you just look through a hatchery catalog online or, or, or if you've got a hard copy, just flip through there. Take a good look at the bird's bodies. You will see the vast majority of birds in that catalog or online catalog have the same identical body shape. There's no body differences. There's no type differences. That's if they're even using real pictures. Some of them use art. Well, I don't know if we can mention specific hatcheries, but I know Murray McMurray has pictures of their parent flocks at the very, you know, they're proud of the fact that they have Amish farmers who keep their parent flocks and will tour them at least twice a year. But aren't they one of the only hatcheries that actually went through the certification process for SOP? I they think they have like five breeds, varieties. For they've five breeds, breeds of varieties. And I'm really interested to see what becomes of this because that's something that's desperately needed on a larger scale. And yeah. they have the resources to do this. Well, not only that, that certification process requires them to be certified by licensed APA judges. Yes. Mm-hmm. So there's is definitely value in that certification process. And it has to be a majority that meet it, not just some, but a majority. More than 50%. Yeah. yeah. I think that's great. It's going to help move the poultry industry forward. Yeah. Only if the consumers care. I think they will. And I'm seeing that shift in, in the consumers acquiring the knowledge to realize that there is a difference between hatchery stock and standard bread stock. And almost 100%. When they look at the two side by side, prefer the look and the appearance of standard bred poultry over the same breed that's just not been selected for that. Now, if we, if we have some of these hatcheries that are going to close that gap, I'm all for that. We'll um, see how it all pans out in the future. Yeah. Well, it's like anything else in life, you know, change takes time. Well, it's going to give the, the new perspective poultry keeper slash breeder the ability to you know, start with better stock. And I think that's a, a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. they're going to be breeding to this standard of perfection. So they should, the new poultry person should be able to continue that very easily. They have the blueprint in the book. All they got to do is continue it. Exactly right. Well, and I know people, people like us co- talking about it. Uh, that's, that's a big reason why, why we do what we do. Uh, I thought uh, it was uh, just hanging out. Well, Well, that too. It goes back to that whole uh, train load of folks, you know. But, Mandy, what's your thoughts on using extreme birds? And what do you consider an extreme bird? Oh, boy, do I have experience there. (laughs) So you guys already know that I'm a big fan of utility and production traits. So there was a season where I got some incredibly... Uh, monster birds as a result of what I had done leading up to that point. And I would call them extreme in their width and their growth rate. And they were just monsters. So I bred them and it gave me a ton of problems where form lost the function. And I saw where it went too far And I had to scale it back and I had to go take some of my hens back to a daintier, more refined male to get back to the birds who could chicken well. And I saw some instances of leg issues where they were bow legged and they didn't have the bone density to support their mass. And it got sloppy. It got messy. It got call heavy. And that's where I was like, oh, okay, so that's the breaking point. Now we have to backtrack and go into salvage because I took an extreme and bred it and it didn't work out well at all. Did you notice it doing anything to your fertility and your hatchability? I didn't have them long enough to find that Mm. out. They just weren't chickening that great. They didn't have the gumption to get up and go. They couldn't get up on roost. They couldn't 
I lost a lot of function, so I didn't even give it the time to find out about the deeper ramifications there. I called that them all. I went back to the drawing picture. board that season. That's the thankfully wise leader I, in you. Uh, well, thankfully, I had the birds available to backtrack it. Yeah, I well, did not put my whole flock future onto those monster birds going, oh, I'm going to yeah. make the biggest birds in the country. Yeah. No, well, I didn't. It was an epic failure. <laughs> that part alarms me with some breeds. And I'm, I'm not going to pick on any breeds right here. But some folks are constantly selecting for fast maturity, big body size, fast maturity and big body size. Well, the Good other ramification is you can lose that size as quick as you found it. Because if your females mature too early and then that subsequent generation after that, it's gone because her egg size didn't come up. The chick size suffered. The, mm -hmm. Like you'll see it once for a generation. And then if you try to pursue it further, it'll all fall apart on you. Well, and the Cornish cross broiler is a classic example. Those birds are bred to be extreme. They have leg problems. They have heart problems. They can't handle heat. They can't handle cold weather very well. They can't move. They All they do is just sit and eat and drink. And all of them are like a four-way terminal cross hybrid? No, 16. I thought that was like the minimum generations that went into the development. That Which It takes 16 different crosses uh -oh. to produce the Cornish cross we see as a brewer. I wish John's hand signals that he's going through right now were Counting. available for viewing. So you've got the final, <laughs> and you've got two to make that, four made that, 16 made that. So it's one, two, three, four generations to make the final bird. And that is definitely a terminal cross. It's incapable. And each one of those generations or breeding crosses are made to produce a particular result. You know, it may be the obesity gene. It may be the dwarf gene. That's why so many broiler, the slow growing broiler, like the Red Rangers and, and stuff like that, uh, you cross those together, you're going to get about 25% of those birds are going to be dwarf. I heard somewhere, and I can't remember where, but that they had introduced the dwarf gene so that anyone who attempted to line breed to make their own flock from it would within three generations suffer the loss of size so that they had to go back and reap. That could to, be speculation and rumor though. To with the dwarf gene, it was very closely linked to the obesity gene. Interesting. And the, the broiler folks first grabbed onto that dwarf gene from a white legger, believe it or not. And that if would you keep them short and compact. And if well, it was tied in with that obesity gene, then you get that exploded size on that shorter structure well man and mandy you process a lot of your own birds think and explain the difference between the size of your bird's legs and wings to a cornish cross bird legs and wings longer by a lot yes dwarf, dwarf gene at work oh yeah because it would shorten all that up and make it more compact and then you get that double muscled effect and they don't walk around as much so they're therefore not walking off weight yeah what do you guys think of the folks who constrict the feeding regimen on the Cornish cross so that then they can use them br briefly for hybridized projects? Cause I always see that as like a really short term project. Like it's going to, it's going to have a shelf life for how long that could be. Uh, give an example to that and to answer that uh, the New Hampshire's from the Henry Noel line. They, the hatchery told me one time when I was thinking about using them in a cross, said, when you breed them, you're going to get about 25% dwarf birds. And when you raise them, you have to feed them just every other day or they get so big, they die early, they develop leg problems and they can't breed. And, and to get good egg production, you got to restrict their feed just because they grow so big. I had a friend and I had, to, I helped him one year evaluate his New Hampshire's who's out in Oregon and I, he pulled out some birds for me to look at. He said, now these are my black ops birds. And there was cockerels <laughs> that were weighing 17 to 20 pounds. Wow. At, and a chicken that's turkey weight. Those things would wear you out. Just picking them up and evaluating them. 
But what he had done, he had crossed in a red, a red ranger and, and literally their legs were as big around as two of my fingers put together. They were huge. Like the lower leg, the scaly part. Yeah. The shanks, but he didn't keep that up very long. I'd imagine not because they, he had to limit feed them. And that and adds it, a whole other level of, tedium to your yeah. daily chore list well you bring up a, a very good topic of feed and nutrition and its effect on the birds and the feed conversion rate versus age of processing yeah. and what's the sweet spot that keeps you in a sustainable territory rather than commercial well i think um, no matter what we need a high quality nutrient rich diet and then we oh limit yeah energy and calories after well that. think of it this way if we need to what you feed those breeders translates directly to the quality of the hatching egg, which translates directly to the quality of the baby chick you get. Absolutely. What's the first um, thing a human female does when she finds out she's pregnant? Start taking folic acid. Well, and everything else, too. Yeah, it's but so critical. Prenatal nutrition. I, I can't ex express enough that you need to have a really good, high-quality breeder diet. And a, a good quality breeder diet is going to have extra vitamins and minerals in it. I learned a long time ago that 16% layer feed is not a breeding ration. Nope. Not even close. Not, unless not they've ever. got free range to offset the nutritional differences. And a lot of times that won't do it. And then a commercial off the shelf, even with, you know, several acres of free range, I would not consider less than an 18%. If I was going to use a commercial feed to get, the additional nutrition, the, the pumped up amino acids, the pumped up vitamins and minerals, I would use a feed supplement designed to do just that. Now, I see a lot of folks, oh, I, I'm not buying that supplement because it costs too much. They'll buy 16% layer. They'll go out and then buy high protein catfish feed or cat food to bump up the protein and the amino acids. When it winds up costing them more to do that, than if they would invest it in a good bag or, or a bag of good fur trail breed or show bird supplement. Well, the birds are going to eat what they feel compelled to eat if it's yeah. there. And when you put down cheap food full of fillers and stuff, they're going to eat and eat and eat and eat and still come up lacking to where then you're going to run into the issues of them wanting to eat on feathers and eggs and each other Yep, because they still feel that they're lacking in protein and the amino acids and all of that. And if you just set them up right from the get-go, you can save yourself a whole bunch of grief. And a whole bunch of money. Yeah, that yep. too. If, you, I, if you're birds, and it's my cause, when I stopped trying to save money on feed is when I actually started saving money on feed. And there's yep. definitely an irony in that. And the further down this rabbit hole I go, sourcing my whole grains and, you know, wheat, barley, corn, getting the essential things that I don't have local access to shipped in or going to pick them up has really helped bring my feed costs under control and increase the diversity of the bird's diet and made it more resilient. I think people just don't realize that when they shift from a lower quality big box store feed to a high quality, good breeder feed, they're going to save you anywhere from 15 to 25% in feed cost alone. With While also improving your hatch rate, improving your growth yeah. results, improving yeah. through the whole chain of the flock even. Yeah. But none of this is any good without grit. Appropriate no. size. Uh, absolutely. You know, earlier we were talking about the importance of, of big gizzards. Well, grit is one of the things that will help build those big gizzards. That gizzard needs to be working all the time to grind the food, to feed the bird's body so they can produce good, high quality chicks. I it's, saw recently where someone was feeding grass clippings and I cringed inside, wondering mm, how much grit they had provided. And it not. had started a debate on if that was healthy for the birds or not, because yes, they need their leafy greens. But if you provide it to them pre cut, it's a predetermined size they have to swallow. And it took me back down memory lane where I had a very, very nice Moran's pullet, and she had just started laying. That A color was there. Her color was there. She was a blue. She had that lacing. She was she was a dang nice bird, 
And she started going downhill and I was trying to figure out why, what's going on. And I did everything I knew how to do. And then at the end of a week, I had to call her. So I called her and then I opened her up and guess what I found inside of her intestines? A giant blockage of grass. Yeah. That had um, come all the way through the crop, the gizzard and into her gut and didn't work out well for her. And I've never fed grass clippings ever, ever again. Run ahead of my mower. We were talking about this earlier. So they they learn this behavior where they don't follow the mower. They walk on each side of the mower and they catch mm-hmm. all the bugs that jump out yep. of the way of the lawnmower. You know where I learned that? I was working with my uncle one summer on a big cattle ranch and we were putting up hay. And there would be a whole line of birds walking just crammed up against the front of that mower as it was cutting grass. And man, they were grabbing bugs right and left. Yeah. At first, I thought they were going after the grass clippings, but then I noticed it was the bugs that were jumping yeah. out of the way of the yeah. mower. Oh, they know what to eat. When I was a kid and I was uh, doing labor on the homestead, I guess you'd call it, and I was doing planting and digging holes with a shovel, I'd have at least five, six, seven birds following that shovel around. So as soon as I stuck it in the dirt, they were there to collect all the worms. Yeah. And I'd be lifting that shovel quit. full of dirt out with a chicken standing on it. Here again, I'm going down this rabbit hole. But People spend a lot of money to feed treats for their birds and, and grow mealworms or whatever. You know, an easy way to give your birds a good high amino acid treats. What's that? Take a bale of hay and throw it out in a pen. Let it sit for three or four weeks and then turn your birds in on it. That thing will be loaded with bugs and they'll turn that hay over 16 ways from Sunday. Yeah. Have you seen the pastured poultry methods where they range them through an area of pasture and they set up compost within that area. And I I can't remember the guy's name, but he'll take a circle of wire and put it inside that area. And he'll take all of his bedding waste from the coop Mm -hmm. where he cleans it out. He puts a tarp inside of that coop so they can lift the tarp, carry it to the cage, drop it in there. And then they start putting all of their kitchen scraps in there and they build up this caged compost situation. And when he would go out and put the chicken feed out, those birds didn't run for that feed first. They ran instead to the caged up compost and jumped into that and started eating yep. there first. And then when he would move the birds further down and he would rotate them through, they would take those piles and either spread them out where they were, or they would collect it and then use it in the garden. And it looked That's really very, efficient. Very, and the birds very, figured out. Very little can turn over a pile of compost better than a bunch of chickens. Yeah, so by the time he was working them down, like he moved them forward just 10 feet at a time so that he could move that ring down. So the older piles were still incorporated to some extent. I think it would go up to like three or four piles before they moved too far away. Another side effect of that, though, is he's not allowing this extra foraging and scratching to dilute his base nutrition. Right. Not exceeding what we all refer to as that 10% threshold of treats. Another thing to bring up is empty proteins, because I see a lot of people trying to look for deals on the dried out mealworms. And it's really important to know that once you dry a bug out, it no longer has the nutritional content and it's nothing but candy. Once, well, once they're dried, there's the amino acids are not there anymore and it becomes an incomplete protein. They've got to be live. You can even uh, gut load mealworms. You can give them a calcium oh, yeah. bump like they do oh, yeah. for reptiles. The thing that concerns me about even some live mealworms, but especially dried mealworms, most of those come from China. Oh, yeah. There, there is no telling what those mealworms have been fed to produce them. Well, if they're dried out, it doesn't much matter unless there's residual. Well, a lot of chemicals and maybe yeah the, the contamination why are we importing be- mealworms from across the planet because we <laughs> import a lot from across the planet we can get it cheap we can get you them can cheap. take your chicken feed and grow your own yeah i mean it's it's one step removed i mean it's a lot of extra effort but you could raise worms well, on your chicken feed live bugs are the best bugs yeah yes and if you want some good cheap entertainment, you got fifteen. Give them a or 20. fish. Give them a whole <laughs> fish. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, go out and get a handful of crickets and throw in the pen. That it, that's good redneck entertainment. Trust me. Mm-hmm. But I, I I'll sum up 
the basics of what I think about for poultry breeder nutrition, and and then we'll probably close out. We've gone, we we've kind of beaten this subject to death. But to get a breeder breeder feed, if you can't, if you can't see if there's a feed mill close to you that makes or will make you a custom breeder food. If you do, there's recipes for that that developed by Jeff Maddox on both his, our uh, Poultry Keepers 360 Facebook group or in the Poultry Breeders Nutrition Facebook group uh, that Jeff has. Just remember, try to avoid using feeds that were created for other livestock. If it says for catfish, feed it to catfish. If it says for dogs and cats, feed it to dogs or cats. And the same thing goes for supplements. You know, a, a supplement I see talked about is this colored cell stuff. And that was developed for horses. Wasn't developed for chickens. And, and the, go ahead. The metabolism is different. The nutritional needs are different. Everything's yeah. cultivated for the specific species. Right, right. And then if you're feeding outside of your species, there's going to be something that's too much and something that's too little. So, you know, feed them good, nutritionally fortified feeds developed for the breed and the purpose. And by all means, offer them grit. Always, always, always grit and oyster shell. And don't confuse oyster shell with grit. Not if same the poultry that. need to rely on oyster shell as their only source of grit to provide the action for their gizzard, they're going to be up taking way too much calcium and have kidney problems. And it's just well, not a good not, thing. Not only that, it's much oyster shell is much softer than grit. So it's just not as effective at grinding feed, particularly whole grain feeds. We appreciate you joining us. And until next week, be sure and keep your birds happy, healthy, and productive. We'll see you folks. Bye-bye. Bye now.